society is very it's very focused on people's opinions and feelings. When actually science is it, to be a scientist is to be trained to be the opposite of that. I think that I, I would delight. I, I would take great delight if someone t t turned up tomorrow and said, "Actually, the universe is not 13.8 billion years old. It's 6,000. We actually made a mistake. There's this new evidence has come in, and it turns out that's all nonsense." I would actually genuinely be very excited, but I don't think it's going to happen. But it would delight me. It would not be an assault on my very being. Indeed, it would. It would be. It would confirm that my excitement would confirm to me what I think of my being as being. Right? It was. A, it's a, someone who delights in intellectual challenge. I, I, and I think that's that's trained to an extent. In it's part of the scientific training. But it's also a wonderful way to be. You know, imagine that every a science book start. Well, of course, we, we may be wrong, but. That, that's, that, that's implicit in every science book. It should be probably explicitly stated. Of course, this might be wrong. Um, I, I, imagine if every book, if every philosophy, if every religious document began with that. Imagine if the Bible started, of course, we might be wrong, but in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth without form and void and darkness on the face of the that, that, would, that would be rather refreshing, I think. It's a refreshing position to take. Certainty is the enemy of science. You know what's beautiful about that what? right off the bat? Like, he's basically, I mean, we know that science has gotten us farther than any other tool we've ever had at our disposal. Anything Certainly of farther anything. than religion. So to hear him say that, I think that that's probably why science has triumphed, because of that wonderful humility, that willingness to change course, that willingness to find new evidence that turns everything on its head and allows us to update, correct, and upgrade. What I love about scientists is that they, they're never like, that's definitely it, like good scientists. Yeah, unless it actually is definitely it. <laughs> because <laughs> there are some things that are def like Earth definitely goes around the sun. Earth well, that's is definitely arguable. Round. Let's not get into that. <laughs> Earth is definitely round. But from the frontier, yeah. when we are in the act of discovery, stuff can go any way. Yeah, so for my next clip with Professor Brian Cox, an astrophysicist and a physicist walk into an office. What happens? We have to talk about wormholes. Yeah. We love wormholes. Who, do, who, who, who doesn't love wormholes? We'd love to use some wormholes. Let's see how that okay. went down. Not to name drop, but I, I talked to Stephen Hawking about this, actually. And he pointed me to a paper he'd written in the 70s, I think, or 80s, called The Chronology of Protection Conjecture. Um, the problem with this paper. The yeah. problem with wormholes is that you, it looks like you can build time machines, because you can, you can get back into the past. Yeah, if you can beat a light beam, you can go back in yes. time. And, so, and the wormhole would be the light beam. Yeah. Yes. So, so he proposes that that's not the way the laws of physics work. It's a conjecture. So it's, it's an axiom almost. So what, what it's doing in, in technical language is it's putting causality as an axiom, the idea that cause and effect can't be reversed. So wormholes seem not to, not, not to uh, agree with So that. if he's right, then they're impossible. Yes. So he would say that if you take that conjecture seriously, then when we have a quantum theory of gravity, so when we understand um, gravity in more detail than Einstein's general theory of relativity gives us, then there will be some physical process that does not allow wormholes to exist. Yeah. Uh, Jason, do you, I, do you have thoughts about causality? Well, I'd be very interested in this notion of once you start playing with causality, what does that say about everything? Everything, you know? <laughs> because a wormhole allows you to beat a light beam. If you beat a light beam, you can disrupt your own past. Right. So normally we, you think okay of, with that? we think of things beginning, middle, and cause effect, right? Can an effect be a reason that a cause happens? I mean, is that what he's starting to play yes, with? Yes, yes. If an effect yeah. can cause a cause. cause. Yeah, can cause its own cause. Can cause its own cause. It's the snake eating its own tail. If an effect can cause its own cause. It's Escher's hands, the hand drawing the hand that's drawing it. It's paradoxical. If, a, if, a, if an effect can cause its own cause, does that require the absence of free will? Because it's going yes. to happen I think, anyway. Because well, it has to happen. Yeah. Well, it, it's a necessary paradox. So it tells us that free will doesn't exist, but yet from the point of view of subjectivity, we feel free and that's all that matters because subjectivity is all we ever get to know anyway. So it's one of those things where yeah, it's all predetermined if that's true and free will doesn't exist, but it doesn't really matter because I feel free and I feel like I make decisions every day and that's all that really matters.